but super to yes uh, we we're going to speak english no um yeah I, we've just been speaking german that's why um well it's really nice to finally do a recording for voices of the regeneration with you because we've been working together for um what four years now um we met in 2019 in a very auspicious place in delphi um at a wonderful conference um what was it called again the the conference you remember no it was uh, I, now, yeah now assembly nature of wonder now nature the now assembly. Now assembly. yeah um and yeah, I would, I would just love to, for, for those who, a lot of people people know that we've been working together and know about the MOOC, but before we go there, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story, because I think it's it's a unique um, and quite impressive story, the way that you weave together um, a very diverse transdisciplinary approach um, through design towards sustainability and regeneration as an, as an academic. And have been very successful at that, at that at that teaching at different universities, but then you have this this other really important aspect to your life, which is the the, the mountaineering and the expeditions and the um, pushing physical limits and and understanding that having those two dimensions is mutually um, enriching in the sense that your work as an academic wouldn't be the same if you weren't also a mountaineer and and a bit of an ex extreme sports uh, fanatic. <laughs> so yeah, tell, tell me a little bit more about yourself. How did this all start? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. It's an honor to have this discussion with you. And I'm so much appreciating um, all the time of uh, yeah exchanging ideas. Just a second. Sorry, ich muss dem Handwerker und sagen, es geht so nicht. I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing it, but, but yeah. Oh, was fragt mir vorhin? Ich mache mal kurz Pause, ja, eine Minute. Finally, we're sitting down to have a recording for Voices of the Regeneration after working together for almost four years now. Um, really lovely to have this conversation with you, Tobias. And um, I'm reminded that we met in probably one of the most auspicious places one could meet at the Oracle in Delphi, um, in, in Greece, at this wonderful Nature of Wonder assembly um, that the, the Dolphin Embassy called, and with, with, with a remarkable group of people, really, um, like Nora Bateson and Thomas Bjorkman and um, Jeremy Lent and all sorts of people. But of all the interesting people that we had I had conversations with, um, our meeting was the most auspicious because we've really actually done some stuff together since then. And um, I normally start this series always when I talk to people with asking them a little bit about their personal journey into wanting to work on creating a regenerative future and um, unveiling the, the regenerative activity that is actually all around us. And um, so Tell me a little bit more about your uh, your journey, both as an academic, but also um, your other big passion is um, mountaineering and and pushing your body to the limit out in nature. Um, and it's really informing how you do your work. So I'd be really interesting uh, interested to know how that came about. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, for the opportunity for this discussion. Um... We've been uh, talking a lot the last years, and I can really say it's been shaping my thinking. So I very appreciate it. And I remember I came to the Now Assembly because my sister Miriam helped me. She made me aware of it somehow and helped me to get in. And, and, and a major magnet to get there was actually meeting you because uh, I saw your book. And there was actually somehow also an opportunity that um, we should grab sometimes, try to grab. So. And this maybe bridges nicely over to, um, yeah, the kind of dichotomy between the interest, the deep interest in curiosity, science, I guess, and, and the fascination for digging deep and, uh, and the relation with outdoor sports, art activities. Um, because 
for me, it's really, it's, it's actually two or three elements. I think the third element is building and doing something with a hand that creating something. And uh, I think the fascination of, of reading, of, of collecting data, of thinking through a process in depth and trying to make it as, um, you know, objective in marks and transparent as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to help our know our knowledge building, but also our critical thinking, and that complements that obviously involves a lot of sitting and 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 you know eyes on the computer and on on documents, and it being very precise. And then on the other hand, being outside is just the the kind of um, yeah counterweight I would say of um, relaxing your eyes of of exploring nature, of exploring yourself, of connecting with oneself, of spurring critical thinking and, and um, creative thinking, especially. Because whenever I'm out in nature, then the thoughts start um, running. Mm -hmm. And uh, this obviously informs then back uh, the academic work. But the, the creative doing has actually always had an important part for me, especially building with natural materials. Um, the wooden house here in the background is maybe one one example that has been really important for me. And I wouldn't be happy if I would just ski more and surf more. At some point, the kind of meditative process of creating something with the hands yeah. that's lasting and that is a different way of connecting with material the system that's been, um, I would say, one of the three legs that have been really important to me. This is fascinating because it actually makes me realize um, the way that you just explained that. Um, that like one one thing that I found just um, again auspicious um, was that when we started the MOOC together, um, or you you started the MOOC that, that I helped you cu curate, um, in one of the first live conversations with the students, um, somebody from the audience highlighted that um, C. G. Young because I was talking about Young's four ways of knowing. And then somebody from the audience highlighted that C.G. Jung actually was teaching at ETH at the time that he, he worked on all of that. And um, what you're actually explaining to in, in my way of listening to you is that for you, the, the sport and the, or the, the being out in nature and, and, and really um, pushing yourself into situations where you do have to rely both on your knowledge on how to work in a situation like that, but you have to rely on your senses, your feeling, your embodiment, and also in, in many ways, in extreme situations, intuition is what ultimately guides um, what needs to be done now, because it, you need instantaneous decisions. You can't get collect all the data and make sure you, you, you take the right um, pro probabilistic path. Uh -huh. And um, in many ways, that's having because that's your background and and really was also your um, your mental scaffolding for developing the MOOC and now the CAS and and the Executive Masters to bring these things together. It's it's a powerful way to come into both valuing the thinking, which is what ETH's strength is, what university's strength is, the, the analytical mind of a analysis, um, deep understanding of a subject, and and um, and then a peer network agreed way of understanding and working with that subject. Um, but what we really need right now in this complexity is to remember that our human faculties are so much wider than just the analytical mind. And that in our regenerative past, we very often had to, because we had, didn't have as much knowledge as we now have to, uh, through science and technology, um, but we did have to participate in nested complexity that we couldn't predict and control. And we actually relied a lot more on the sensing, feeling, and intuiting. And, and for me, part of, of the dance we've had in the last um, three and a half years of, of working on this material um, for these courses together is exactly wanting to build the bridge. Like how do we connect the, the brilliant minds and, and um, 
excellent scientists of the ETH University, the, the MIT of Europe, with the cutting edge of the, the warm data, um, participatory, listen to social, contextual data and understanding the work, uh, world as um, networks of relationships, to, to speak in, in Fritjof Kappa's terms. Uh, bridging that, not devaluing one and overemphasizing the other, but um, bringing a more holistic, embodied sensing and intuiting, including way of becoming more than just change agents of actually becoming people that in their own integration express the change that they're trying to to bring into the world and, and so it's 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 lovely to to make that bridge somehow um from the way that you opened up yes yeah, really really well described daniel uh you know we were we were trained we're still training in academics us and people to formulate a question a research question and then uh, collect data and then analyze that system there mm -hmm. which is really you know no critics to that that's absolutely a, an important craft in a way of, of reasoning and um and in this journey not only in this drrs mooc program but through teaching a course at the university of freiburg germany since 18 years the called sustainability leadership training which I developed that time in a, in a master thesis to have a program that really reaches any discipline, any academic discipline, and it's actually enriched. The more disciplines come together possible, the better, through a kind of outdoor experiential pathway. That's not only fun, that's of course important because people want to come together. So we need a bridge, like a, you know, like a starter, like a Tinder to come together and say, yes, you know, this sounds so much fun, so let's do it. And then obviously um, connecting with each other as a, as a learning community. And nothing is better than, let's say, a mountain bike tour, for example, where everybody sweats, where you know, primus inter pars, everybody's the same. And I'm sweating as a professor and maybe a student is faster, whatever, you know, and then there's a, there's a tire that cracks and then you work together, it's raining and they jump into a lake and you see we're all just humans working together. And that helps a lot in working as a community. And even more so, the connection with the inner self. I have to say, what I've been trained in and what I, I love to do is describing that system there. Today, I have, I'm much more conscious about the, you know, our own perspective, our own role in being part of systems, our inner development. And to me, today, what's in our current programs, um, I think the, the, maybe the, the, the scaffolding is the kind of analytical capacities of using different types of data and, and describing it and so on. Um, but, but the, or, and the inner core to me comes really back to ourselves. How do we deal with complex situation uncertainty? How do we learn and connect with ourselves enough that we can actually overcome um, times of frustration, of, of um, anxiety, of uh, not knowing what to do, of big tasks that seem too big to do. And this to me is something we learn by being active outside in nature, is really understanding our comfort zone, understanding where's our, let's say, uncomfortable zone, where's our panic zone, and being able to play a bit with these boundaries and knowing by experience we can tap into the unknown and by doing it in a certain way, by building our skill sets, our personal skill sets, both mentally and physically, and also, of course, relying on community, on other people at some point, but really comes back to ourself to be able then to have this notion, yes, I can deal with uncertain situations, I can change myself, I can retreat back into safe space, and I make it a practice, I make it a flow experience. And this to me is the most powerful and most important skills that I have to say that then helps to address and engage with all the methods and the tools and the data and the processes around us. And that comes back to, you know, many of these activities outdoors. Again, I think it's fascinating to see that, that you can also like 
from a kind of scientific history of science perspective. Uh, um, at some point, quite a while ago now, in the 1960s, uh, late 1960s, early 70s, with the Macy conferences, um, science got to the point of saying, okay, um, we're beginning to map systems, but we're still doing it as out there, kind of objective systems that we are kind of separate from. And then somehow in the Macy conferences, people were started to bring the, the kind of non-linear mathematics of Poincaré and the and the um, three body problem, the, 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 the root of the kind of um, complex dynamic systems are fundamentally um, unpredictable, but which doesn't mean they're not intelligible. It's a big dis uh, difference and, and, and like the whole concept of physical attractor, like the uh, attractors and complex dynamic systems as um, the bit that is intelligible and understanding the phase shift, how the system goes from one pattern to another pattern. But another really important thing that came out of the Macy conference or developed out of that is um, the capacity for second order observation, where we include in our science the way we think about our science, which in physics Heisenberg got to many years earlier. But, but what, what I think we're now working with in this MOOC and in the series is to make people more aware of the um, second order observation of how am I observing and how am I gathering data and what mental constructs, narratives and, and mental scaffolding or organizing ideas um, influence how the world shows up to me. And, and, and through that, once you experience that, and the best way to bring people into an active embodied experience, so it doesn't sound too conceptual, what is he talking about with second order observation and so on, is pushing oneself into in extreme situations in nature where you get to that point where you in a you have to react to the context you're in, but you're also getting to the point of observing yourself of like exhaustion and 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 like oof, now I need to really like it, it becomes real, it becomes visceral. Yeah? And and once that's in in somebody's experience, particularly well guided, like like you do in your programs. Um, making people aware of, of this process, then you can begin to apply the very same. Um, the peculiar thing is that it's not a distancing from the matter, it's an actually entering deeper into the matter because you, you're beginning to see that you're not ju just working with a system out there, but that, that you're actually an expression of the larger system that that system sits in. and And so that there's a relational dance between the two. And, and, and again, like we're staying within the science story, that's what Bateson started to talk about in the ecology of mind, that, that what, what Maturana and Varela developed further, both in the, the theory of um, Santiago theory of cognition, but also in, in autopoiesis, yeah? the, the, the cognitive coupling that, that it is through the act of participation and the first distinction, this is me, and this is the context that we actually create the world. And that, and, and, and I think this is precisely the most important point that when we work with regeneratively with a system, we have to understand that our learning of exactly this dance is probably one of the most regenerative things we can do in enabling more people to think in that way, because it's then no longer about the outcomes, the solutions, the, the experiment done and written up, but all of that becomes stage points in a continuous process of learning and capacity building of how to work and dance with complexity. And, and that's that's why I think the, the courses are having such an exciting uptake, because you, you brilliantly had um in over your different because you, it'd be nice to for you to say a little bit more about the different universities you're actually working with because that also is unique in most academics sort of sit in their institutions and build their rank in their institutions but you you've always been a weaver um not just between disciplines but also between universities and bring it bringing them together so um yeah maybe maybe let's hear a bit more about that
Yeah, one, one notion on your beautiful framing of this um, metacognitivity of this being conscious about our own journeys and our own position and our own stabilization with systems is uh, this, this beautiful um, notion, uh, also didactic, that we, we used in this DRRS MOOC series. It's called The View from Above. And to me, it was inspired, the term was inspired by Philip Vandenbroek, Shift N was also a contributor in this program and a good friend. And we prototype a course together here at this real world laboratory on Visa Institute in the Italian mountains about flying drones to literally, you know, have a tool, a toy that hovers and actually can see and can zoom out to see where we are in right now from above to see structures, patterns, and, and, and dig down into some, some root cause maybe. And this, this drone flying course, view from above, obviously was connected with climbing a mountain, even just a hill, even just a, a bridge to have a view from above and practice this zooming in, zooming out, getting an overview, seeing where I am, what we are, um, where I am myself. Um, and then also finding different entry points to zoom in on what matters most. And the second person who inspired me here um, a lot as well is Eric Burlow. Uh, California, and a very good friend, um, also from skiing, mountaineering, um, in addition to science. <clears throat> and he had this, uh, this notion in, in one of his TED Talks about better understanding structures of networks, different types of networks, social ecological networks, and to see patterns by zooming out. And while we often focus on a singular problem, by really digging deep from where we are, digging deeper, we sometimes lack the perspective because the problem might actually be two or three connections away and not where we zoom in. And so the whole didactic mountaineering drone flying, so different activities, different embodiments, come back to this view from above, zoom out, zoom in, understanding, or maybe using understanding of complexity in a certain way that we are better to focus on what matters most in that particular situation. And um, that, that combination of having such, let's say, deep science discourse of deep ecological discourse as well, and the embodiment in a way that is really physically challenging outside in nature, that to me has been missing. All my work life, I've been looking for these communities and also for these places and environments be it as a, being as a, I know, trained as a mountain guide or being in, you know, a demonstration team of the German Telemark team. So beautiful environments, mountain biking, but to me often has been either super focused on the sports or super focused on, let's say, science or maybe deep ecological discourse somewhere. The combination has been missing for me. And that's something I think that has been motivating this DRS program development, other courses over a long time. And now it comes together and, and it actually also brings people together with similar interest. You also love outdoors, love the nature, right? You are a professional diving instructor. And um, we uh, went uh, stand up paddling together on Mallorca and cycling. And, you know, all these types of, or you work so much on your, on your land, right? You are showing so many inspiring examples how to regenerate land and also experimenting out there with dirty hands in the soil. And so um, I, th I think to me, this has been missing and lacking. And I think that's one of the bridges we're building here. Well, also, I think it's, it's, it's more than just building a bridge, because if you do not have this connection on either side, you can get dysfunctionalities because, you, because it creates people who are either like, if, if people don't build that bridge in themselves, then they divide naturally the world into practitioners, doers, and theoreticians, thinkers. And, and then we get this, this ivory tower um, syndrome that universities end up being in, in, enshrined by their own frameworks of theory because they're not really making the, the, the step into applying it. Um, and and we even create a cultural narrative that that I find even in the sustainability and regeneration movement, the 
the tendency that when people have been sitting together in council or in collective um, uh, processes that actually access collective intelligence, it can still, you get half of the people after a day like that saying, okay, enough of the theory, now let's do something. As if what they've been doing together was not also a practice. And, and actually, in terms of design, more upstream in the flow of design, in the, in the meta design of shifting narratives, shifting organizing ideas, and then everything downstream, like the product design, the architecture, the urban planning, or whatever comes out of these new frameworks, actually transforms. And so it's, again, only by creating courses that, that bring people into um, reconnecting their capacities to be both, to be an embodied, sensing, feeling, intuiting human being, and a good scientist and um, analytical thinker and systems um, that, uh, thinker, it, it just loosens both ends of the spectrum up because you can think much more in dynamic interlocking scales of complexity if you live it in in an embodied situation out in nature and in, in, in doing something. Like the, the design component is also, like as you said at the beginning, that, that it's the third component get, because it, it, it brings yet another opportunity to bridge because in actually doing a practice, there is always a theory in it, even if you don't make it explicit. Like a lot of people think, no, no, I'm a, I'm a craftsperson, I just do things. But, it, but you do it on organizing ideas, mental scaffolding, um, and, and on learned skill. But, but, but it's helping people to make the tacit knowledge of what they've learned to do with their hands and in that flow state more explicit that also helps science because we, we need to, to bring explicit expressions of good practice back into the theory. Um, yeah, if I'm, I, I like to talk about this hybridization of science design and practice. So maybe the bridging, as you said, is a bit, I know, too, too distant. But with this hybridization, this merging together and finding, uh, finding interplay at, at, at porous system boundaries that somehow are more like, you know, porous connection zones. And um, when... When I worked at the University of Applied Sciences in Eastern Switzerland in, in Coor um, and leading the research there in tourism, you know, and, and, and like mountain themes, what, what I was missing at some point really is that we talk so much and we do so little. We know so much, actually. We know enough to act and, and still we... And especially in, in, in that part of the academic work, we describe a lot, we analyze, and then we leave, basically. And, and that leads also to developing this um, yeah, hybridization project, this Monvisa Institute here, the uh, Real World Laboratory. And one experience that really stands out for me was with a, a master's student from ETH Zurich, a master's student in integrated building systems. So a very integrated interdisciplinary study course on systems, building systems. And he did, um, he did a semester project here to model the energy performance of this passive net positive house, how I call it. So it's a developing the passive house further into a more place-based, more organic uh, living structure. And he helped a lot by modeling, doing a very proper scientific analytic approach of understanding the place of understanding the photovoltaic, the wind, the other thermal potential, geothermal potential, and model the whole thing by even looking at the horizon and you know how the sun actually touches the building and what kind of wind systems. He did a report, and he also had a beautiful graphic of the southern facade and its renewable energy potential. And his work was done, it was a semester project. I've been using this graphic for a long time to help actually communicate that we need to employ the southern facade for renewable energy production. We cannot live in a place with eight hours of sunshine, even in December, and not use 
this energy while you know importing it from nuclear from France or you know as we see right now in Europe being dependent on uh, on oil and gas from other countries. And when I told the students, the student that I've been using his graphic to talk with architects, with planners, with officials to you know spur thinking. Uh, to rethink the building codes, which prevent and they avoid using the facade because it's protected for you know cultural reasons. He was not very comfortable with that because he thought, "Oh, my data is not accurate enough. You know, how can you how can you use that data? It's just you know I'm, I'm not sure if it's if it's right enough." And that for me was really a, um, like cornerstone in in understanding what we need to do. In addition, we need to train. And, and work and, and educate and learn ourselves methods, such methods very properly and, and be very humble with what we you know, bring out and be transparent. And yet for a real world transformative impact, that sometimes is not really the point. It needs to be good enough. Just the fact that somebody from outside, from another university, not myself, did that research and saying, well, this is the kind of potential that was already enough to help others open up and come into a process of joint, you know, learning and some kind of, yeah, place-based regeneration. And this is to me really an, an illustration of what we need to do more. And that's uh, a big motivation for me. Well, one thing that, that we all also have had a lot of conversations about, and also we had, um, Maybe a little flashpoint in in the um, in one of the webinars in the first MOOC run, the incredibly successful first MOOC run of two thousand five hundred people from one hundred and one countries signing up to the better version that normally gets maybe fifty or one hundred friends that sort of semi join in to to better test the MOOC. So it was really quite quite for me even like I I just couldn't believe how uh, resonant people were, but. Both, both you and I um, meet in the understanding that it doesn't serve at all to describe regenerative as um, like a bit from this attitude of, I can't believe you just used the S word. Um, are you still talking about sustainability? We're all from so moved on now that we all talk about regeneration and then people get sort of uppity about um their limited understanding of regeneration and um, at the same time dismiss uh, everything that has come before in under the heading of sustainability and, and like I personally find it, it it's really not helpful like while I, I believe that there's a very distinct difference between working um, regeneratively and what conventionally is now being called working um, on sustainability we both meet in the agreement that there are lots of people in the history of the um, sustainability movement that actually had a awareness of what they were doing was sitting in nested complexity, was trying to build the capacity of people in place to keep evolving with new situations as a respond to change. And in many ways, had a very dynamic focused on the learning of people in place approach to sustainability and in that sense that's very akin to what we're now talking about when we're talking about regeneration and and even there's always been an undercurrent a subset of the sustainability movement that highlighted the importance of genius law side power of place um sense of belonging um small is beautiful local regional as the focus of activity again very akin to what we now um highlight as distinctiveness of, of of regeneration so um in that context we can go back into your story a little bit because you're actually a forester and um one line of storytelling about the roots of sustainability go back to von Clausewitz, a german um forester who maybe from today's perspective, was already a little bit strongly in the, in the um, utilitarian value of nature perspective when he was talking about how can we manage our forests in such a way that future generations will have similarly abundant forests to manage. Um, 
But, but nevertheless, um, the word Nachhaltigkeit was coined by him and, um, and at least in the German speaking world, that, that, that's what we have used to speak about sustainability. So tell me a little bit more, how, how did a forester become a, a mountaineering guide and, and running courses on um, mountain tourism and then um, now heading the um, systems design lab at ETH? And you, I mean, you, you have so many facets that we can't get through them all in this this talk. Like maybe I'd, I'd also love you to tell a little bit more about your skiing um, and the, 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 the you don't only ski, but also make skis out of mm -hmm. hemp with your students. Yeah, so I think that, you know, growing up in a mid mountain range in forest, there was not much more than forest around me. I have to say, a small community, and but uh, at that time, a different climate. I really recall when the reservoirs, the freshwater reservoirs froze for three months, we could go ice skating. I would build a snow cave and an igloo, and it lasted for three months, temperature minus 18 Celsius. So growing up in that way, um, I found natural attraction to exploring more and started, you know, with my first camera, kind of photography trying to uh, getting like a deer from distance and doing a training as a as a hunter which uh, where i grew up it's actually a one year long training and uh, the the actual hunting shooting is a tiny part the much bigger part is is relating and you know with nature and spending so much time out in nature and having encounters with animals that i would say in in this period of of being trained practically as a hunter and, and being out in nature for so long, I somehow, I wouldn't say learned more, but I learned very different things than from in the forestry program at university. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, this of course, has been shaping a pathway of, um, yeah, deep connection with nature. And that somehow spurred my sustainability understanding, which for me has always been, like I never understood how, humans, us and economy could be separate. I never understood that deeply, never. But it was so logic that we can only, uh, there's no business to be done on that planet, right? The even in our world. And so this has been evolving over time. And when I studied forest sciences, yes, you're right. I still learned that um, that 300 years ago, more or less 50 years ago, Karlovitz has you know coined that concept. And, and over time, I'm still in the process of conscious unlearning. And I think you mentioned this concept of unlearning to me. I saw it from your book. I remember and when we met in Delphi and talked and I, I you know, I had looked at your book, of course, and uh, we had this discussion about sustainability as not being enough. And I was a bit, I know, triggered at that point, I remember, because I thought, you know, there's so much in there. Uh, it's so rich. And, uh, you know, there's like, we have to do our homework, I think was one of my, my, uh, you know, um, let's say to be taken with cautious terms and saying, well, we, if we just, you know, dig deep in, then we understand that there's not like much of a difference. And that was just my origin. And we, you know, published and developed a different understanding of sustainability science, uh, kind of, you know, how to form common, um, you know, common ways of, of mental models of sustainability, our fragmental beliefs in our heads. And the, the kind of three-legged dimension was for me way, way away, you know, but of the, the, the cultural dimensions that you mentioned so well. In, in your book, um, they were imminent at some point, but I never used the term regeneration. I also was not so conscious about, let's say, the continuous deep learning processes that we stimulate in place with people and ourselves. That came only from reading your book and from our discussions and my continuous unlearning journey. And so that's, I think it's really an important discourse of, of, of understanding, yes, the sustainability roots to my understanding are actually very regeneratively. Um, they go deep into um, understanding we, we are part of nature and we you know grow together, that's the only way. But then has taken obviously different direction, maybe more limited directions. And that's, I guess, one of the issues we're dealing with today and also in our courses. 
You're muted. That's why I find there's a lot of um, credit to be given to um, my colleagues at Guy Education that, that started the original four-dimensional curriculum on this eco-village design education course, which was really a course about how to enable participatory community scale sustainability transitions. And um, I, at the time, had been working on um, a master's thesis in, 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 in at Schumacher College in holistic science and had really just understood the importance of design as the nexus between theory and practice, as the nexus between lots of disciplines, and as the way to put into reality the scientific worldview that I understood in the Masters in Holistic Science, which, which was studying complexity science with Professor Brian Goodwin and studying um, earth system science or Gaia um, theory with, with James Lovelock and, and talking to uh, Rupert Sheldrake about his understanding of, of the, the interconnectedness in nature and with the physicist Arthur Zions, who uh, like really brilliant minds that, that I was exposed to at, at Schumacher College. Um, and then I started to work on, on, a, on a body of theory that was all around a four-dimensional understanding. And suddenly I hear about this conference at Finthorn and I go there and Guy Education presents the first draft of their schedule and of their, 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 their curriculum. And I kind of go, wow, that's it. That's what I I've been working on. And um, since then, I've, I've been part of Guy Education's development for, for a long time. But what, what I've noticed is that I don't see many other roots of a four-dimensional understanding of sustainability than, than that conversation. And because through the Global Eco Village Network, Guy Education always had a close connection to the UN conversation. Um, at some point, what in the Guy education curriculum is social design, ecological design, economic design, and worldview as the four dimensions of, of bringing all of this together, um, started to pop up in the literature of the United Nations, but worldview was put into culture, uh, which is okay. It's a slightly different meme, but it, it actually, those that dimension, that fourth dimension of sustainability, that moving that moving from the Brundtland Report's three-legged stool to a four-dimensional understanding is exactly the same move that um, we were talking about earlier of the second level of observation. Um, it's making us understand that our core narratives, who we believe we are, where we believe we go, how are we related to the rest of life, um, what is the story around intrinsic value? Like what are our core values of how we see ourselves in this relational universe? Um, that that actually influences critically how we then work with the social, ecological, and economic dimensions of sustainability. And, and in, in many ways, that's also, the again, the shift of what regenerative development um, highlights, that you have to work on the personal, then on the collective capacity, and then you're going into action in terms of doing systems transformation. Um, but you, you have to become more aware of your own perspective influencing how you work and your cultural context or team perspective also influencing not just how you do your work, but building the capacity to do different kind of work. And, and, and again, I would say that that is another uh, one of the, the, the nuances as we now have to actually be careful that like when we talked in, in um, Delphi four years ago, regeneration was still establishing itself. Um, but, but now almost at the other end of the spectrum of this, like how are the, these two related, we have the danger of everybody who's worked on sustainability or anything um, just changing to a new adjective um, a little bit with the excuse, well, yeah, yeah, I've, I've always worked in that way. I just called it something else. Um, and then we get a new adjective, like a new wineskin, 
but the old wine of people just saying, oh, I've been doing this all along. And so it is also really important to highlight these very important distinctions of what we're talking about when we're looking at regeneration, because like another one is, is it doesn't mean we're not looking for solutions. It doesn't mean we're not looking for finished projects and outcomes, whether it's a it's a product design or, or systemic design of some kind or process design or um, service design. But it's actually quite an important gestalt switch to understand that the result, the finished object, is not really the most important thing. And then it's ticked, it's done, and you move on to the next project. It's how you got to that and how that built a learning community, how you learned, how your team learned, how the client learned, how um, the community within which the design sits learned and built capacity about how all of this integrates. That's really the outcome when, when you work regeneratively, because that is something that will, in a, in a systemic, relational, non-predictive and control way, but appropriate participation way, result in all sorts of other design interventions that will keep keep on designing and 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 that's that's a huge shift in focus um and it in and it only makes sense when you bring in that other dimension which some sustainability people have had which is the local and regional focus that that only in the application in a specific place in a specific culture can you create place sourced solutions that that are helping that community to keep learning and questioning those solutions yeah no and and, and as you say i think the the richness is here being cognitive metacognitive of our own individual learning journey and for myself it's really a conscious unlearning practice continuously to say well that's what i learned that's my state of knowledge and it's dynamic uh, and that's also part of science tomorrow we hopefully know more than today right so today we take it that's the best of knowledge we have but we still take it with a grain of salt you know it's it will evolve and so what what we took in our kind of you know mental model of sustainability this this kind of um, six-dimensional building is the the bubble around the participation and to me and time and those to me are maybe uh you know, in of course, based on that we are aware that there is such as worldviews and we have different worldviews and different ways of, you know, where we come from and different ways of reasoning, there still is, it's the necessity to somehow be aware that we need to do it together, right? We need to participate and there's different forms of participation for me. And this starts maybe with being curious and, and asking questions all the way to, I don't know, political engagement and, and, and really doing things. But just opening up and, and, and questioning um, and being aware of this journey and being also fine with going on a journey. It's what we had in the beginning, this uncertainty aspects. Uh, we're doing a mountaineering trip. We take the weather report, the avalanche report. We measure the snow layers. You know, we have our equipment. We are trained. And then we do different planning milestones until the milestone is reached we just go and we observe we don't question because otherwise we would never arrive somewhere but at these milestones it might the plan might change and so living in this uncertainty of of saying well i'm we cannot be really sure what will happen but we have to be masters and maestresses in in moving along and having our cultures and tools to deal with that in an organic way which i call organic emergence you know, an organic, intrinsically supported way, personal development, to deal with uncertainty and actually making a culture out of it, of, of going and walking the talk. And that to me is a bit the participation bubble, which also has this time component of, unfortunately, for myself, learning as well, that changes often take at least a generation of humans, because we build up, we invest, and at some point we reach a phase in life where we keep where we support which is i think psychologically totally understanding when i finish this institute here or we finish the institute i will do all i can to you know preserve it because it's so much work and investment 
And so one of these participation aspects in uh, in the regeneration discourse for me is uh, also requires a lot of attention is that we are again cognitively aware people build something up that's in their time you know an achievement and at some point they want to also preserve it conserve it and then there's new people next generation coming with new ideas and different situations and new energies and so this intergenerational understanding of me as a youngster i respect what they have built up and i don't take it away me as someone who has built something up and arriving somewhere is not slowing down the young generation with their own ideals and mm. in a different time yeah. yeah so this this element in the discourse of regeneration you mentioned that for me it's it's an ongoing of course unlearning journey and relearning learning journey and i think it's it's just so rich also your uh you know um, discussion series here to have this ongoing discourse and being fine with it we don't have to have a fixed definition today but really wrapping our way around and saying, well, these are some cornerstones. This is maybe what it's not. Um, and especially this deep connection with oneself, with the people at place and also with place itself. I think I learned from you the notion of, you know, not owning a land, but being steward of land. And I'm using that since here at this institute. Technically, I own trees that are 100 30 years old and a couple of hectares of land. But it doesn't feel right for me, you know, youngster to say I own that tree, which is 100 years old. I mean, it's, it sounds actually so wrong. And, you know, that's, that's all that's a part of um, then the kind of real world transformative praxis elements. If I don't come here as someone, okay, I bought the land, I own it, please don't touch it. Then the same is for me. Don't touch the other land. Don't, you know, raise your voice. But if we say, we are relating with the land, we are stewards all together, then I might have a kind of boundary where I can do a bit more for a while and someone else do, but we're still co-responsible. So if we see something somewhere else, you know, we may engage in a respectful way. And at the same time, we respect life where we come, including, of course, cultural life in a different way. And that to me is all part of this super rich regeneration discourse. Yeah, I mean, again, making the bridge into complexity science, if we're really stepping into this dynamic nested complexity worldview in which life emerges as a network of relationships out of networks of relationships, um, which is the cutting edge understanding of science, that's um, Fritjof Kapra's systems view of life, um, then you can actually get to that point that you understand, oh, wait a minute, if I am an emergent property within this nested wholeness, and everything in this nested wholeness affects each other and guides the course of the overall evolution of that nested system, then suddenly you're, you're stuck with this um, paradox of participation, which is on the one hand incredibly humbling in the sense of um, wow, I, can't, I will never be able to fully predict and control how my actions will influence the system. So I better be humble and be careful how I interact with it. But then at the same time, you kind of go, oof, the audacity of I can change the system because I'm part of it. And actually, even beyond that, I don't have an option. I will change the system because I'm part of it. And that's the responsibility you're talking about. Like, um, we, we can choose to stay asleep and be blind to how each and every one of us is shaping the future or in the smallest way possible without loading the, the future of the world completely on our individual shoulders, um, we can be more conscious about our way of participating and our responsible bringing forth word in the language we use, in the metaphors we use, in the narratives we either reinforce or question and try to build another one and but i, I would like to make a, a turn into um us spending another 10 minutes or so uh, to talk about um what has actually come about in the last three and a half years of our um conversations and, and, and collaborations um the system of four 
uh, interconnected massive open online courses um, through through edX. So they're free courses that people can take all over, over the world only if they want to um, get an ETH certificate for their participation and they f follow all the, the, the requirements for that. They pay a little bit of money, but then they actually um, get a ETH stamped certificate of having completed these the, these courses and and the whole i'd lo love for you to explain a little bit how, how you very um ingeniously to my mind conceived of giving it away through the mooc like really democratizing education to whoever wants to learn about how to design regenerative and resilient systems and then also understanding that that community that that meets through working together on this separate um, uh, mighty networks platform where there's more capacity for interaction live while people are doing a MOOC, we, we can giga map on on a Miro sheet and and actually shift like like build build a collective product together, understanding mapping together. Um, and then also how how that is now becoming like the the open end of a funnel that takes people into the MOOC, but then offers people who've done the MOOC the possibility to move into a certificate of advanced studies with ETH, which is then a, a more accredited academic um, uh, certificate at the end. And then how the, those three, when they come together with 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 the the personal quest and the application, actually give people the opportunity to even turn it into an executive master's and advanced studies on on that subject. Um, I think that you are saying it takes a lifetime to make a change, but I I think um, as an academic in a highly respected university, that universities aren't that known to pivot change and transform in 10 15 years they they tend to take a lot longer for that uh, and i i feel um you've opened up a conversation within in ETH that is already developing its own dynamic around the importance of regeneration and and it's actually remarkable how how from the early beginnings of the mooc um in only a couple of years, there, there's been so much movement. So could, could you just tell a little bit about the story? Because I came in when we met and then you, you said about six months later, hey, would you be interested in, in helping me think through the, the curriculum of this MOOC and, 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 and collaborate on it? But you, you already had an idea. So if, if you could tell a little bit the story of how, how this came about in, in your own practice and conceptualization of, of, of this wonderful the structured educational experience. Yeah, I think Daniel, that's a nice, um, um, yeah, you know, opening the door. I think when I try now to to wrap it up or somehow of formalize it, maybe three parts of the story. One is um, relations um, with people, because many people have been supporting this, also at ETR, which I'm very thankful for. Um, another one is natural flow, natural energies, because my own journey has been taking so long to see this, what I think is needed so much. And that involves being at, as you mentioned at the beginning, different schools, universities, and also since uh, three, four years actually being uh, appointed at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design in Norway. So as a professor there in you know, systemic design, it's uh, you know, I, the designerly component is so important and we have it, I think many of us have it because we create something intentionally, we express intention through doing as a very broad, maybe understanding of design. And, um, but only, you know, working at the institution of AHO, which I'm very thankful for, opened really for me this different perspective of how designers work, different design disciplines. And this way of, of doing research by design, of prototyping, of doing something because it interests me. And that's so different to uh, what we sometimes um, you know, teach, 
teach in science, but rather finding the gap in the knowledge, the knowledge gap and then forming our process from there. And so one thing, this natural flow of not practicing design for a long time, we're not calling it design really. I mean, you mentioned building skis and developing skis because what we found on the market, what we find on the market isn't, let's say, systemic enough. It's not ecologic enough. It's not holistic enough. And so we developed own skis from hemp fiber composites, for example. Yes, that was all designerly work of prototyping something in praxis that is needed to somehow deal with a situation that's um, not there where it could be. And um, so this, this notion of design the action of understanding the language behind of learning to speak that language and somehow seeing it as so different from the academic scientific language and the cultures. And then we're not talking about practitioners who often you know, are disconnected from, let's say, a good example is an architect, start architect on a building site, often disconnected with the builders because of different language, because of not understanding maybe each other's position and where we come from. So bringing these viewpoints together for me has been a natural pathway because I have been for myself to certain embodying these three functions and suffering it's for myself and, and seeing, well, listen, this is just not right. It's not fair and we are losing potential because all these three elements are so important and we need to encounter all of them together to hybridize them to actually have the power and the leverage together to you know, engage in, in the transformations we have to do. And so this comes together with the second point, relation. And I'm very thankful for different people and also institutions at the end to support such a pathway, which is a designerly way of doing systemic innovation itself, because this program doesn't just fall from the tree and it's against many natural, let's say, resistance. If we think about resilience, you know, and the, how the bowl shakes back and you shake it and it comes back. And this transition pathway of this resilience corridor is it's a lot of activation energy and it's time. So it needs the time it take. And today the time is favorable for waking up enough also in very, let's say, maybe conservative um, elements in, in societies that we need to do more and differently than as of now. And so these different experiences on different universities in different countries and cultures, including Quest University in Squamish, British Columbia, which has a whole program on the quest, on questions and you know forming it, that has been shaping me a lot, including all these discussions. And <clears throat> I want to mention here, uh, that that uh, at ETH, Adrienne Gedrigame, who uh, you know leads the institute where I work, she has been one of these also hybrids. You know, she is very successful in in this institution and the research. At the same time, um, she is one of these people who see the other, who see the facets, and understand and is practicing herself these elements, and so. There's different people on this journey of making this possible who have been, let's say, seeing the necessity, the potential, and also by personal trust, allowing this to develop further. And so seeing and allowing the natural flows to come together and thrive, I think that's for me one point, because then it will work, because it comes together naturally, and so being open for that, having a lot of patience and also some perseverance to, you know, come again because it might be the right thing to do in tomorrow not today so you know if it doesn't work today doesn't mean it's not right and i think if the natural flows point in direction it will happen it's only the question is when and so if you find the kind of relations and supporters like adrienne from the school of continuing education lucas also an example um when when i learned that lucas just you know went to Svalbard, Spitsbergen to experience this amazing nature. It connects to my research there for 15 years in, in you know, Arctic resilience stuff. And so for me, someone who is um, you know, interested in these elements, there's a natural connection point and, and also supports 
people like us who maybe um, are like others working a pathway that's maybe not in line with the current situation, but really breaking things up. And so that's somehow Justina, Justina Swart Paris, uh, you know, work with us together on Mallorca as well. And, and is a, um, um, also a designer and, and bringing different ways of working really deep in our process and our, well, my own unlearning and relearning journey. So all these people, and there are many more working at institutions that support us like ETH, I'm really grateful this is happening and, and these institutions are evolving. It's, I think they're evolving in an extremely high speed of um, uh, going with the time. And that at the end, it's part of research, right? To go with the time as well. But um, for those who don't know yet, um, can you describe a little bit uh, how the MOOC is structured and and, and like a bit the, the, a bit of about the content and also maybe like we've we've alluded to it a couple of times, but those who don't know the the way that you've um, in your own teaching and um, academic practice have also developed these really clever little ways of creating an online course that still invites every single student through this quest methodology to um, take their learning outside, to take themselves literally outside into nature, into doing um, what we've talked about at the beginning, some, some physical activity that, that opens them up, changes for just a short time their um, way of being, um, but with a guided question that the course online invited them to then reflect on and maybe do a little recording. So like, just describe what, what do people encounter when they when they enroll in, in MOOC 1, 2, 3, and, and because right now we've got experience with MOOC 1 and 2, and so just give us a little bit of the trajectory. Yeah, that is also an ongoing journey, and it's uh, practicing what we preach. It's learning by design. It's uh, systemic innovation incrementally. And um, doing it together while learning. So we have four massive open online courses, as you said. Um, uh, the first one is worldviews from sustainability to regeneration. The second one, beyond systems thinking, and both have been taking place in the better version. Number three is systemic design. And number four, transformative praxis. And three and four are yet to come. We started the first version teacher pace. So we had a rhythm, a bi-weekly rhythm of six modules, topical modules per MOOC, and always uh, every week a live session, a live conversation to meet with people and build this community. And um, obviously learn on the pathway, inviting people to join, to contribute, um, being flexible of, of saying, well, there's someone who just heard of this and has so much to offer. This person and his or her work um, you know, were then invited in many examples, and this person became part of the, the project. So the MOOC itself obviously is a virtual program, and it had a lot of live content on the way um, together, and which can be seen as recordings. I think an important part is to that the virtual tools should nudge people to get out in nature, at least outside, I did in nature, also in cities, there's nature, <clears throat> and um, connect with the system, connect with people, with themselves, and, and practice transformative impact. Because at the end, this, this DRS abbreviation, Designing Resilient Regenerative Systems, is really to hybridize, again, science, design, and transformative practice. We would like to spur impact from day one on. And if people are nudged, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a recording, in a video recording, for example, or a reading to then get out in nature um, to self-reflect and self-record about what they just saw, how that relates to their own situation, their own like, life phase, and ideally even switch the camera and see what actually do I see right now in nature? Which spot did I pick in order to... Um, you know, inspire myself and, and connect with where I am and then flip the camera back to themselves and saying, well, now actually I'm focusing on myself. So it's also a change of perspectives. And this is one of the didactics 
Systemic cycles is another one um, that takes people out on a bicycle ride to connect to the bioregion and have more reach with the bicycle, still be slow enough to stop anytime for curiosity, for connecting, for asking questions, or for taking a photo. And so from day one on, participants are asked and nudged and supported to develop their own quest, a series of questions that hierarchically might form over time to an overarching quest. It's like a dynamic tool. And so any, any learning, any activity ideally would be connected with the growing set of questions and the quest that builds a pathway like a spine in a complex journey, learning journey helps to build the bracket around the different MOOCs and then also brings the whole learning journey further into the professional executive program, Certificate of Advanced Study now, coming to envisioned Master of Advanced Studies, being the first element. And then uh, it's a really cool thing. It's students, I just call ourselves, including myself, uh, as a lifelong student. Students, as participants of this program, would then not do their thesis at the end and then say, okay, now I'm finished. Now what should we do with it? But rather the quest helps to form the transformative design project from day one on in the MOOC already, brings it further through the MOOCs for some in the executive program. And so when we learn about social network analysis, for example, and how it helps building capacity, how it uh, helps uncover structures in social networks that we can use actually to spur innovative and transformative capacity, then this is not just theory. This actually gets implemented right away where this student lives in his or her own bioregion, starts building these relations that are so important. And then at the end of the program, the kind of design project is basically, it's done almost. It just has to be wrapped up because it's happening from day one on. And that there's a fascinating way to work and I think that uh, also takes account of the urgency that we have to do more right now of these things. And la last question, um, because uh, it's another facet of all of this, um, which is the, yes, most of these programs are virtual, but nearly all of them are somehow also blended whether it's a blend of taking people out inviting them to go out by themselves but then at least the the CAS and the envision masters um do have a cohort of a sp specific group size come together in a in a physical place and um as part of that we've been um or, i mean you 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 build locally rooted relationships in a number of places of which our collaboration here on Mallorca is, is one of them, but you, you have one in Norway and then you have the Institute that you're sitting in right now in, in, in the Italian mountains. Um, and you just briefly mentioned systemic cycles as, as, as something that, that again, is a wonderfully developed, applied, moving through landscape, meeting people, gifting to the people and receiving from the people. So it's very regenerative. It's not a tourist experience that is extractive. It, it really um, it has a reciprocity and also agency in and of itself. Like while people might just spend 10 days doing a systemic cycle trip, the echo of that, the ripples of that might actually lead through to, to um, transformative change um, through the people that have been visited. Um, so, yeah, could you tell a little bit more about these three um, places or case studies, real world laboratories, and um, and also about the, the, the systemic cycle methodology that you've already tested in, in a number of places? Yeah, the, the building this deep relations with the place, that's something need to be experienced. I remember writing about tourism, researching about transdisciplinarity is different than actually uh, being a tourist. And it's different to, to write about mountains and being a mountain inhabitant and seeing the whole thing from a completely different perspective, which I have to say today um, can hardly be constructed, needs to be experienced. And so a real world laboratory like this one or 
um, some focus maybe more on the also on the bioregional scale so bioregional learning centers different terms to me they all have in common that the system boundaries are not constructed they are open if they are boundaries and they are porous so it's like flowing it's like happening you cannot plan for it you get to deal with what happens and it can fail at this moment obviously and you you come into a place and you promise or people have mental models expectation in the head they will be disappointed for sure and that's different than having a research project for three years where it's easy to come in do your thing and get out again and if it doesn't work out you're gone in this config context a real world lab and deep relations we are in for a long time so mm -hmm. we continuously have to regain uh, trust basically over time and these are just some you know entry points into the three places we have been um, interacting with the most yes it's the Monvis Institute here and the Italian Piemont Mounds community of Ostana it's Hemsedal, Norway, through the work of the Oslo School of Architecture and Design and the colleagues there and Haley Fitzpatrick, who is comparing this place in a PhD work, who is a very close collaborator also in the MOOC series. And um, what you're doing, what you have been doing in Mallorca. And when we visited you a couple of times, just getting an idea of the richness of the work that you have been investing into this island context. And so... We're having a um, you know, Central European mountain context. We're having a Mediterranean island context with you. And we're having this northern, let's say, towards the Arctic kind of um, relation. And there's more coming. There's a um, project in the Laguna of Venice, uh, you know, a huge campsite place, which also evolves. There's Annecy, France, with uh, Benjamin Maria, who's also a contributor here. So three main places for now where we learn a lot from and much of the program to me is is strongly influenced by these learnings in this real world labs the program wouldn't be the same if we and i wouldn't be be part of a real world lab because the perspective change is more than i could read about mm -hmm. it's it's much deeper and it forms exactly what we talk about it forms the capacity to design resilient regenerative systems and so in the CAS, in this first certificate of our studies, people, participants, um, a group of maybe maximum 20 will is invited to come here to this um, real world lab in the mountains for 10 days. And just in short, but we will develop a serious game. So um, a kind of a serious play, a serious game in a context of the difficulties and challenges of you know, the alpine and the urban, um, the different cultural constraints, the strong tradition and the needed fast innovative transformation to the future, visible everywhere and feelable everywhere. And uh, my colleague Nicolas Saliu from ETH, who is a, a very experienced serious design, a serious game designer and researcher, will develop and prototype this game with us participants on these really complex and also complicated topics together with the people over here where we have this seven eight years relations so it's it's really deep yet uncertain and in the part of collecting all this data and getting participants to understand enough of actually relating with the place enough will be a systemic cycles two or four days where together with uh, martin schutz who co-developed systemic cycles from uh, eth as well will be here and join us and take us on this weaving bicycle tour where we connect with many different actors in terms of companies, in terms of land use types, different people, both planned, but also emergent. So opening of just being guided by curiosity and by, by the moment. And later on, invite these people back to our serious game prototyping. So... You know, a lot of the theory that we bring in this virtual part of the courses will be practiced here in an environment that's somehow designed for that in a very experiential way. We are forming a team. We're building trust as a social cohort. And 10 days of physical outdoor relational experiences, including putting your hands in the soil and, and understanding permaculture work. You, for example, are growing hemp. 
uh, or harvesting hemp at that time, um, builds then uh, a, a physical learning experience that's more than meeting every week in class, way more. Um, and, and I can say that through the, the decades of these outdoor experiential themes, that's super powerful. And participants can take then this experience back to their own bioregions to practice these elements where they are, to also build physical relations more and more in addition to their own networks by saying, well, let's do a systemic cycle it's just a day, you know, where we are and expand on it. And so it really builds this capacity in this um, place-based regeneration pathways that we experience here and that we then mentor and nudge in relation to their own personal quests to happen towards their transformative design project. Excellent. Um, I'm just also, just from the experience of the, the first two runs of the MOOC, the agency that this dynamic already is unfolding, like we're, we're, we're still, we're, we're still needing to run the second two prototypes. It's it's all moving. It's all in development. There, but there is a dynamic path of how this can grow and scale out rather than scale up, scale into other places. Um, is already conceived of, and and everything is running su such that it really seems promising that, that that this will be such a rich opportunity of of learning. But then. Even if it stopped today, like the people who connected on that fir those first two masters uh, two, two MOOCs, and how they already are taking what they've learned into their professional practice, and the feedback that the, that we've been getting from from those participants, where it's just the right level of feedback of saying it's been challenging, it's pushed me to my my edge, it really made me question things, and then. But I'm drawing on it every single day now, and I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for, for having been part of it. I mean, you you couldn't really wish for better feedback um, for for any kind of academic or, or didactic program one design. So it just to, to finish off, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure to be able to work on this with you, and and um, I'm excited about the ongoing journey and doing a systemic cycles on Mallorca sometime. And um, yeah, it's we're, we're only in, in early days in many ways. But then if I look at what's actually already really happened, it's not a theory. Um, and because we're both bringing in different dimensions of this and, and the, the amazing team of people that um, you've, you've actually uh, put in relationship to each other on the strong basis of you having formed individual relationships with these different people earlier in your journey um, makes this, I think, one of the most unique programs on the planet at the moment um, with regard to um, really bridging regeneration into practice and into academia and into a more mainstream, um, like, deeply respected academic context through ETH. It's 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 a re really it's a pleasure and a privilege to be involved. Yeah Daniel, thank you so much. You are um, a, a very important part of this uh, process uh, for me specifically as a learning and unlearning partner and also um learning about your work on Mallorca and being inspired. I hope that in one of the next CAS we may possibly be also able to join you on Mallorca and sometime in Hemsdal, Norway. And uh, for now, we have more than 40 different, you know, let's say educators, practitioners, scientists, designers uh, involved in this DRS program of contributing. And uh, it's already happening that alumni of the MOOC come back and say, well, I have, you know, this knowledge, this experience, this project, this practice. And they are now getting into the next iteration of the MOOC. So it's actually self um, refreshing itself and building community. And this is uh, fascinating to meet these people, to learn from these people. You have an amazing network. And each time we speak, you tell me names where I just, you know, my brain is pouring over. <laughs> but it's um, it's part of this journey. So I really see it as a, 
and I think that's to wrap up myself here, it's it's part which is so difficult for us humans in our cultures here is to understand it will not end. It's not like, uh, you know, tomorrow is over. So it's a continuous journey. And I think for myself, I'm trying to make a culture out of it because then it's not like, you know, stress and hopefully it's over soon. No, I try to accept it as part of life, this journey with all its beauties and all difficulties and make it a culture. And then I'm not hasty anymore. I can accept it and, you know, accept that this is now what it is. It takes the time. Let's focus on beauty and also, you know, arrange us with the difficulties. Super. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. Um, stop the recording and then we just wrap up.